So I got to tell you something you're not going to like. I promise you're not going to like it. But I want to be really clear about this. This is not my opinion. This is simply a fact. Like it or not, I'm just telling you the truth. You ready to hear the truth? That wasn't very encouraging. <laughs> yeah. Do you know when someone says to you, you want me to tell you the truth? Ah. Here's the truth. You're going to die. You know, we don't like to think about it. We do a lot to avoid thinking about it. Uh, we'd like, we all know the fact, someplace in our head, we know we're going to die. We like to think we're going to die when we're really, really old and we're going to go to bed one day and not wake up. Wow, that would be wonderful. But that's typically not how it happens. But nobody gets out of this world alive. That's just the way it is. That's just the way it is. Which causes me to ask this question. Something that I think we should think about on a regular basis. What happens after we die? You know, the actor Keanu Reeves? Either we're going to be pulling teeth or we're going to have fun. Which one do you want to do? Do you know who Keanu Reeves is? Of course, the Matrix guy. Yeah. Well, he was asked this question. What do you think happens after you die? And he gave a really thought. He's a pretty decent person. He gave a thoughtful answer. He says, well, the people that love me will miss me. Well, that's true. But it kind of begs the question, doesn't it? A surprising number of people these days believe that nothing happens when we die. We simply die. Stephen Hawkins once wrote, I regard the brain as a computer which will stop working when its components fail. There's no heaven or afterlife for broken down computers. That's a fairy story for people afraid of the dark. Wow, I don't know about you, but I cannot accept that. I, I will not believe that. Not just because I'm a Christian and I believe in an afterlife, but because it simply doesn't make any sense to me. Live, grow, mature, struggle, create, create a life, create a family, a church community, build a business, work hard, sacrifice, and what do you get for that? Death? just doesn't seem right. Every time I face death, most recently I got called to the hospital for uh, one of our parishioners. And um, I had to sit in the room with his dead body with his wife. And every time I'm confronted by death, there's something repulsive about it. It just doesn't seem right. It just doesn't seem that's what should happen. It's always like a surreal experience. And there's a reason for that. But Thomas Aquinas said that humans have souls. And they're designed to return to the Creator. Look outside the Christian tradition. The Quran says Allah takes the souls after death. Even Plato, he was like an agnostic. He was a philosopher. Even Plato talked about the soul as the home of logic and that he considered to be the most divine of human actions. I don't have to be a Christian in order to take this kind of reasonable approach to the issue. Maybe that's why so many non-Christians have developed similar views on the nature of the next life. Long before Christianity, the ancient Egyptians believed the afterlife was a place of final satisfaction and joy for those who are able to attain a life with the gods. Um, the followers of Zoro, <laughs> I never get this thing, Zoro, Zoroastrians believe that those who died would eventually be brought back to life and judged so that final justice could be served. There are many, many, many similar examples of such expectations in the afterlife throughout history of the entire 
history of humanity. It's been there. Now, just let me be a lawyer here for a second. There's, a, let's say, an accident, okay? You're the, the police officer on hand. Are you with me? So what are you going to do? You want to know what happened, right? So you go to this person. Did you see what happened? Yes, I did. Tell me what you saw. And they tell you what happened. Then you see this person, not related to this one, from a different perspective. You walk over here. Did you see what happened? Yes, I did. Tell me what happened. And then you see a person over there, and you say, okay, did you see this accident? Yes, tell me what happened. And when all three of these independent sources tell you basically the same thing, then you kind of reasonably feel you have the truth. That's right. So now stop and think about this. From the very beginning of the history of record of man, we have across languages, across histories, across cultures, across different religions, we have a similar story that people believed in an afterlife. That some form of life exists after death. Why? Why would that be the case? Let me suggest it's because we are made to believe in an afterlife. It's part of our DNA. And why would that be but for the fact that we were created by the divine and designed to return to the divine? It's kind of like God planted a homing device inside each of our souls. Whether we know it or not, whether we're aware of it or not, whether we acknowledge it or not, there is this hunger, striving for this idea of life after death. It would be wickedly depressing to think that all our feelings, our experiences, relationships, the love that we've had in this world simply ends when our bodies die. Or as Hawking so mechanically put it, break down like a computer. If the soul dies with the body, then what would be the point of our existence? Now, I believe in heaven for many reasons. First, because down inside of each of us is a yearning for something beyond this life. This life is incomplete, it's imperfect, and we yearn for another life that won't be that way. And this yearning isn't just wishful thinking, it's deep-seated convic conviction that God has placed within us. This has been the most common experience of all people from the beginning of existence. And the scripture tells us why. In the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 3, verse 11, we read, God has also set eternity in the hearts of men. God planted that feeling, that desire. God planted that belief that there is more. Second, for those who dare to call ourselves Christians, the evidence is even more compelling. We believe in God, and we believe in God's promises. In John chapter 14, Jesus tells us, I'm going to prepare a place for you, and once I find that place, I'm coming back and I'm taking you there. What's he talking about but heaven? He's talking about going to heaven. In John 3, chapter, 13, chapter 3, verse 13, Jesus tells Nicodemus about heaven. He says, no one knows anything about heaven except the one who came from heaven. In other words, me. And I'm telling you, heaven exists. So if Jesus says that heaven exists, and he's telling people that heaven exists, why wouldn't we believe that heaven exists? In Luke chapter 23, verse 43, Jesus is hanging on the cross. He's dying. And the good thief, he turns to and says, today you will be with me in paradise. And I could go on and on and on and quote with Scripture and specifically what Jesus in Scripture says about heaven. Jesus clearly believed in heaven because he came from heaven and he knew he was returning to heaven. And if that's what Jesus believed, then that's what I'm going to believe. Heaven is real. Amen? Amen? That still doesn't answer the question, though. What happens after death? Well, it's a growing thought or belief in our culture today that God's mercy, as awesome as God's mercy is, is just going to envelop all of us, and we're all going to get to heaven. Now, I've got to tell you, I really like that idea. 
I like that because I know I'm not the best person in the world. I, I, I know that I haven't been the kind of disciple that I ought to be. So when I think about this, all my sins, I'm thinking, okay, that's good. I can rely on God's mercy instead of my faithfulness. That's a very appealing thing. I also firmly believe in the idea that Jesus died on the cross and that his blood, that sacrifice on the cross has set me free from sin. And there's a definitely a lot of truth in both the mercy of God. It is amazing. It's unmeasurable. And also the idea of this enormous sacrifice that Jesus has made so that we might be free from sins. The problem is with this idea that we all get to heaven, like, you know, everybody in the class gets an award. The, the problem with that is it doesn't exactly line up with Scripture. What am I talking about? Listen. Let's go back to the Old Testament. Daniel chapter 12, he describes what will happen at the end of time. He writes, Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awaken. Some shall live forever. Others shall be in an everlasting horror and disgrace. Listen to the book of Revelation, because the book of Revelation talks about heaven more than any other uh, book we have. So he says, this is um, chapter 20, verse uh, 8. Then another scroll was opened, the book of life. The dead were judged according to their deeds by what was written in the scrolls. The sea gave up its dead, then death and Hades gave up their dead. All the dead were judged according to their deeds. Then death and Hades were thrown into the pool of fire. This pool of fire is the second death. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the pool of fire. If heaven is real, my friends, so is hell. Listen again to Matthew 25, verse 31 through 46. Jesus talking, gives a parable of separating the sheep from the goats. I'm not going to read all of it, just part of it. And then he, then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you accursed, into the eternal fires prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you did not give me food. I was thirsty, and you did not give me drink. A stranger, and you gave me no welcome. Naked, and you gave me no clothing. Ill and in prison, and you did not care for me. Then they will answer, Lord, when did we see you and not do these things? And Jesus says to them, I say to you, what you did not do for the least of these, you did not do for me. And these will go off to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Based on such passages, and again I could go on and on, it would seem no matter how attractive the thought that everyone gets to heaven, there's more to it than simply saying, I believe in Jesus. It's not like putting on a jersey that has the name of Jesus across the front. Faith is more than that. Jesus if we, if we wear a jersey like that and then go on living as if Jesus is somehow just peripheral to our lives, that doesn't get us any place. For Catholics, we believe that Jesus died for our sins and that the blood of the cross has freed us from our sins. But we cannot go on living like we were before. We can't just presume on God's grace. We have to cooperate with God's grace by living virtuous lives. Not believing in any way at all that our behavior somehow earns heaven. We can never earn. We never can get to the point where we deserve to get to heaven. But we cooperate with God's grace as a sign and as evidence that we love the Lord and have accepted redemption by living as his disciples. And we talk a lot about discipleship here. Be disciples, make disciples. Living as disciples is not so easy especially in a divided and secular world. I know that some of you 
Honestly, let's be honest here. Some of you get irritated at me because I won't leave you alone. I, I, I know. You know, I'm always saying, sing! No, I'm saying, participate! Do Alpha! Help the poor! Pray! Read the Bible! And I know that some of you would just love to come to Mass and be left alone. Shut up! I get it. I understand. But how can I, as your pastor, do that? How, how can I do that if these things are true? Number one, we have souls that live beyond our physical death. Two, that heaven and hell are real. And it's God's desire that we all live with him in eternal life in heaven. Three, not everyone will be received into heaven based on how well we have cooperated with God's grace by living as intentional missionary disciples. And four, if I love your souls. I know for you, for many of you, I'm just the guy up here ranting all the time. I know for you, I'm the guy that takes care, signs the checks, deals with all the personnel issues. I'm that guy. But for me, you are everything. For me, you are my family. For me, my responsibility is to do my very best to get you into heaven. God entrusted your souls to me. And so how in the world could I keep my mouth shut? How could I not want to do whatever I have to do to make you take this seriously and live life differently? My mom used to, because I was a lazy kid, she used to tell me this uh, little parable. You remember the, the story of the ant and the grasshopper? Remember, those of you who don't, I'll really quickly tell you. It's like, you know, the ant stayed focused, worked hard, stored up food, built a cozy uh, environment. The grasshopper, it just went out and did whatever it wanted to. It just had a good old time. Didn't take it all that seriously. But then winter came. The grasshopper comes knocking on the anthill and says, let me in, let me in, I'm freezing out here. And the ant says, well, you didn't do anything. I did all this work. I got all this food stored up. You know, the ants is cozy in their little environment, and the grasshopper was left out in the cold. I, I really think that story applies to us. We've got to take this seriously. Those things I harp on, especially prayer and reading the Bible, are ways that we stay focused and ways that we live intentional lives as missionary disciples. How could I not want to encourage you, push you, and even sometimes pressure you to take all this seriously? <laughs> and it's not like I'm asking you to eat cream spinach or something like that, or some horrible, tasteful, distasteful thing. I'm asking you to surrender your life to this awesome God, to know and develop a personal relationship with God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. A relationship that will only bring you joy and happiness, courage and strength, hope and peace. Knowing Jesus, talking to Him regularly by reading His love letter to us, and then loving on others as He's loved on us. That's a wonderful thing. That's not a painful thing. That's not a burden. That's an opportunity. So sing! participate, do alpha, help the poor, pray, read the Bible. Amen? Amen? Husbands, get your wives to heaven. Wives, get your husbands to heaven. Parents, get your children to heaven. Let's all of us help each other get to heaven. Amen?